Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, so today I'll be talking about uh, today I'll be talking about uh, time liquid crystals. Uh, which are phases of matter which are somewhat unusual and very different from the usual phases of matter we are familiar with like liquids or solids or magnets uh, wait i have to okay fine so everything so yeah these are phases of matter that are very different from usual phases of matter that we are familiar with like uh, you know liquids like this or solids like this or magnets and uh, these phases of matter are common uh, exist in a kind of non-equilibrium system called active matter. And I'll spend quite some time telling you what active matter is and uh, why you are interested in studying that. And uh, then I'll tell you about uh, this new sort of phase of matter. And I'll define each of these terms as I go along. Okay. So I'll start by uh, asking what active matter is. And it doesn't work now. Yeah, okay, okay, good. So active matter is a special class of non-equilibrium system with two key characteristics. A steady energy input at the microscopic scale, that's the scale of particles, and performance of work in dissipating that energy input. So I'll take some time to break uh, this down with examples. So first, note that all living matter by definition are active. They can uh, go from, you know, components inside a cell to cells themselves, uh, to bacteria, to multicellular organisms like birds, animals, or even us. Uh, so if you, so inside the cell, you have uh, things like molecular motors. So molecular motors uh, convert ATP or adenosine triphosphate into ADP or adenosine diphosphate and use that energy to work on protein filaments like this. Uh, at a larger scale, you have bacteria, which converts uh, sugar into energy uh, and uses that energy to rotate, uh, to, you know, rotate some motors, which rotates the flagella and the bacteria moves because of that. At a larger scale, again, you have birds, which convert, you know, fruits and uh, seeds and whatever into you know energy to flap their wings and move because of that or we you know we convert pizza or sandwich into a talk right so in all of these cases i told you that uh, you have an internal energy input so you know these objects uh, take up energy from either an ambient fuel tank as for the cells here as for the intracellular uh, things here or from an ambient fuel tank, as for the bird, and converts that into energy, uh, sorry, and converts that into some form of motion. But you know, motion is common. So what is the difference between these kind of motion and the sort of motion you'd see if I take a powerful enough microscope and look at the molecules on this table, they'll continuously jiggle, right? So what is the difference between that kind of motion? So more, uh, so this is a kind of motion that is not active, this is, a Brownian motion. This is uh, half a micron particles in a fluid. And uh, these particles are continuously being buffeted by much smaller particles of the fluid, which you cannot see, but which keep moving all the time. And uh, this is, I think, the first video of Brownian motion taken by Jean Perrin uh, in 1923 at Ecole Normale. And you can see they are continuously moving. These uh, Brownian particles are continuously moving. So Jean Perrin then, uh, sorry, I admit them, otherwise my. Uh, so then what Jean Perrin did was uh, basically take, uh, take, uh, you know, uh, oops, yeah. So what Jean Perrin did was, uh, you know, take photographs of this at 30 second intervals and uh, then he connected uh, the points of the part that the particles were in 
in successive frames by a straight line. So you can get a sort of a trajectory out of the, uh, from for the particles out of this. And I'm saying sort of a trajectory because this is not really the real, these are not really the real trajectories of the particle. That would be uh, much more, you know, wiggly. So, you know, instead of these straight lines here, uh, these straight lines would look like miniature versions of these, you know, quote unquote trajectories, right? So these would be really, really wiggly lines. But you can see that, uh, you know, these particles are moving all the time in a random fashion. And uh, this is a more modern version of this taken exactly 90 years after uh, Jean Perrault's uh, video. This is uh, thermal fluctuations of particles in a self-assembled colloidal crystal. You can see that they are continuously jiggling all the time again. So what is the difference between these kind of motion and uh, this kind of motion of the bacteria? Well, what the bacteria does is that uh, it rotates uh, its flagella in counterclockwise manner, and then it moves in a straight line like this, right? So your flagella gets bundled and it moves in a straight line like this. But after a time, after some time, you know, it rotates its flagella in a clockwise manner, and then it doesn't move forward. It just basically tumbles. It changes its direction. And then again, it uh, rotates its flagella in a counterclockwise manner, and moves in a different direction. So if I look at a bacteria over a long time, then I see that you know it moves for, uh, for some time, then changes the direction and moves again for some time. And at long times, this motion, uh, this trajectory that you will have is not that different from the trajectory that uh, Jean Perrault drew. So what is the fundamental, is there a qualitative difference between these kind of motions that uh, bacteria performs and you know the motion sort of motion which we call heat right uh, coating clausius so what is the difference between motion which we call life as in for bacteria and the motion which we call heat well there are multiple differences one of the more interesting and important ones is the following so if i take a brownian particle or any particle with thermal in thermal uh, which is moving because of thermal motion and i uh, uh you know draw i you know i take uh, calculate i obtain the velocities of many of these particles uh, over and over again so that i can draw a probability distribution of the velocity here in two dimension i find that if if it's a brownian particle or if it's a particle in a the thermal motion then the velocity is has a mean at zero that is there is no preferred speed of the particles right however that is different from uh, you know this kind of motion of a bacteria the, the bacteria controls its speed internally by controlling the speed of its motor so therefore the probability distribution of the velocity for a bacteria will look like this will have this kind of a you know volcano like shape and which means that the bacteria has a preferred speed at which it moves so this is one qualitative difference between uh, you know sort of motion which you call heat and you know uh, these kind of motions of bacteria or uh, these kind of uh, motors molecular motors okay so uh, Till now, I have uh, said that uh, living materials are active, but are only living materials active? Are there non-living active materials? Yes, there are. And there are multiple uh, non-living active materials. And the reason for this is our definition only said that active uh, particles convert some energy into some, into some kind of a work. And uh, the way uh, active particles convert energy input into work, we don't care about that. So for uh, living materials, that pathway from, you know, so food to work is very complicated. It involves metabolism, uh, you know, for human beings, it involves the entire digestive process, etc. And uh, we don't care about that. So because we don't care about that, much simpler objects uh, artificial objects which are not living are also active by uh, this definition. So here, uh, these are uh, particles 
uh, one side of which is more shiny than the other, these are Janus particles, so that when you shine light on them, uh, these particles move much as the bacteria moves, because one side of it is more shiny than the other side. Uh, these are oil droplets with some surface chemistry in a micellar surfactant solution, and these guys move again uh, very much like you know how bacteria would move uh, because of some surface chemistry. These are interesting. These are basically, if you look at these polar rods happily moving along here. So these are basically, you know, uh, things like pencil leads, which are on a substrate that is being vibrated up and down. And uh, these objects take in that energy of that vibration and move in the plane because, uh, yeah, these guys move in the plane. Again, this motion is again very much like the motion of the bacteria. Uh, so these are all examples of artificial active systems which have been constructed. Uh, people uh, regularly use them you know, for experiments. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so by definition, active matter uh, includes all living objects, but not only living objects. There are artificial analogs of active systems. So to you know, focus uh, one of the simplest ways of seeing uh, what object is active and what object is not is the following. So if you have an asymmetric uh, or a polar object, if it is passive, then both the position and uh, the orientation of that polar object will diffuse in time. So here, uh, Zeiss are just noises. So these guys, both the position and the polarization of uh, some asymmetric or polar object will diffuse in time if it is uh, passive. However, if that object is active, because that object converts uh, a source of energy into uh, some sort of work or motion, uh, this active object will have, in addition, a self-propulsion velocity in the direction of its orientation. So this object will diffuse, but also run along its, the direction it is pointing in. So it becomes motile. So that is the crucial difference between uh, an active object and a polar passive object, uh, sorry, a polar uh, passive and an active object, right? Okay, so now we understand uh, sort of what active particles are, what active microscopic active units are. Uh, the most interesting question uh, that we ask in active matter is about collective behaviors of a collection of such active particles. So this is, uh, collective behavior of lots and lots of these uh, molecular motors and lots of lots and lots of these uh, micro uh, filaments here actually it's microtubules and uh, this is a bunch of bacteria happily running along in a fluid this is uh, a murmuration of a starling it's a flock of starlings and uh, this is a whole bunch of uh, these kind of Janus particles which form and break up in this weird fashion which would which is very different from what would happen in any equilibrium system. So the collective behaviors of these kind of active particles are very different from our usual collective behaviors that we know of in thermal equilibrium. Uh, thermal equilibrium uh, uh, concerns closed systems, that is systems in which uh, there is no input or output of energy. These are systems at constant energy. And if you take if you look closely at these systems, if you look at the particles in these systems, right, then uh, you cannot say whether you're running a movie of these particles in this system forward or backward. Technically, that means you have a time reversal, microscopic time reversal symmetry. And, uh, you know, uh, these are basically all systems we actually learn about in high school or even at mostly at universities and uh, we know how we at least know the rules of collective behaviors of these systems uh, we know how to construct statistical mechanics or thermodynamics of these systems we know that these kind of systems can order because they minimize energy or maximize entropy so these are two examples so these are particles in which uh, there is an interaction between the particles and because of that uh, this kind of a structure minimizes the uh, energy of the system 
and therefore this kind of a structure is favored. This is another example. These are hard rods with only hard uh, hard sphere interactions between the particles. So they they have no interaction other than just you know telling them that you know if they hit each other they cannot penetrate each other. And in this case, you form this sort of a nematic structure, not because you're minimizing energy, but because you're maximizing entropy. Uh, that is because you want more wiggle room uh, around each of these uh, elongated particles. And that's why you organize it this kind of a nematic structure. So we sort of understand how uh, collective behavior works at thermal equilibrium. We may not be able to calculate everything because it may be technically challenging, but you at least know the rules for this. We at least understand the rules, right? Now, these systems are actually all open systems. They are not at a constant energy, but at a constant energy throughput. In each of these systems, there is a, the, uh, there's an energy input and an energy output. There, there's an energy flux through the system. And if you look at uh, you know, individual particles uh, in these systems, you cannot, you can immediately say whether you are running the movie forward and backward or backward. For instance, if you look at the bacteria again, uh, if you run this movie backwards, you can immediately say something is wrong because, you know, the flagella is moving in the upper, wrong direction and the uh, bacteria is going on, going in the wrong direction for, uh, given the flagella motion. And in these kind of systems, we actually don't know the rules for constructing statistical mechanics. We can find out the rules in individual cases, but we actually don't have general rules for this kind of system. And these systems can order not by maximizing entropy, but also by locally decreasing entropy. And this does not violate second law of thermodynamics. And I just want to point this out for a second because you know one of the most famous uh, books in sort of biophysics is uh, What is Life by Schrodinger we introduce the concept of negentropy. So I just want to point this out a little bit and say that, you know, uh, if you have an open system, you can take in uh, low entropy uh, things and you can, your input can be low entropy and your output into the environment can have higher entropy. Therefore, within your open system, you can actually decrease entropy uh, while increasing entropy globally, both within the include globally by globally, I mean, including you, the system and the environment, you can globally increase entropy by decreasing entropy within your uh, system. So here in these kind of open systems, you can order by locally decreasing entropy. So these are some examples of open systems you can have, uh, you know, if you take a coffee and stir it, that's an example of open system. A current carrying wire, all of these wires are actually examples of open systems. And then these are all examples of open systems. This is a collection of catalytic colloids plus fuel. By the fuel here is light. Uh, this is a uh, bird flap plus food. This is again bacteria plus food and uh, some intracellular gel plus adenosine triphosphate. These are all examples of open systems. Not all of them are active because Remember, activity requires uh, energy input at the particle scale. For steadily stirred fluids or current carrying wires, your energy input is not at the particle scale. When you have a steady stirring, you are in introducing the energy at the scale of the cup itself, right? If you're stirring coffee, your introduction of energy is at the scale of cups and not at the scale of individual uh, water molecule or whatever. Similarly, for current carrying wire, you have a potential difference across the wire and that is where you are introducing the energy which are very different from these objects where uh, the energy input is at the scale of microscopic units that is you have an arrow of time at the scale of the particle right so we understand okay what how collective behavior in active systems is different from collective behavior in passive systems but uh, okay so why do we actually want to study this so the grand challenge uh, of this is to understand uh, the organizational principles of living matter. How you know uh, large scale organization in living matter happens, how tissues organize, cell layers organize, and finally how uh, you know how you have development and morphogenesis, how cancers spread, and how animal groups behave. And we 
want to ask this as condensed matter physicists. So we want to ask questions that condensed matter physicists ask, but for living materials. And physics enters uh, these kind of living materials in two crucial ways. One is mechanics, because mechanics enters everything. So you have particles moving around in a fluid, that's mechanics. You have uh, gels, that's mechanics. And the other crucial bit is information. So when you have, uh, you know, birds uh, moving through the air, birds cannot look behind them. So they look only in front of them. And uh, so they have incomplete information. So they look at their neighbors in front of them. Uh, or you have signaling pathways uh, in, uh, you know, in biology, which are all information and uh, they affect uh, both mechanics and uh, other aspects of living materials. So classic active matter, usual active matter theories uh, till a few years ago, main uh, focused exclusively on the mechanics and completely ignored information aspect uh, of the problem. And that is that was in part the success of active matter was built on focusing on the mechanics. Now we are slowly introducing information back into the picture while retaining uh, the focus on mechanics as well. And uh, eventually the goal is to have both active mechanics and active information and understand functionality of living materials, how living materials ultim ultimately, how living materials sense or signal or replicate or even evolve, right? So this is the real goal of why we study active systems, right? And uh, so this is for living materials and uh, we use these artificial uh, active materials as sort of our test beds to test our physical uh, theories because they're easy to construct and control than living materials, easier to construct and control. So now uh, let me give you a concrete example of how uh, collective behavior in active systems differs from collective behavior in passive materials. So one of the prototypical, perhaps the prototypical example of collective behaviors in passive materials is a magnet. A magnet is a bunch of spins which interact via this energy or Hamiltonian. So each individual, which basically just tells you that, you know, neighboring spins want to point in the same direction. So individual spins, each individual spin will have a dynamics, which will tell it to, uh, you know, try to align with its neighbors. And it will have a noise, which, you know, is a random uh, fluctuation, right? So at low enough temperature, and at high enough dimensionality, and I'll not tell you why I say high enough dimensionality in this talk, but if you're interested, you can. Uh, but at low enough temperature and high enough dimensionality, uh, we know that the spins point on average in the same direction all through the system, that is the average magnetization is non-zero. And the direction it, uh, the spins point in is arbitrary. It's not determined by this, uh, energy, the Hamiltonian, nor is it determined by this equation of motion. So the spins could have pointed in all direct, any arbitrary direction. That the, the fact that it points in this direction is not a given. It could point in this direction as well or this direction. So the fact that it points in a direction, it chooses a direction to point in arbitrarily is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the spins have spontaneously chosen a direction to point in. So this is, uh, this is the, what happens in equilibrium, right? You have a spontaneous symmetry breaking and spins point in the same direction and that's the end of the story. Now, what happens in an active system? Well, in active systems, if you have any asymmetry, uh, activity converts it into the corresponding motion. Therefore, since spins are polar, an active, an active polar object or an active spin will move in the direction it is pointing in. And this completely changes uh, the game. So this interaction between the spins is still the same as, uh, so you know, in a active version of that uh, magnet or a flying magnet or the eponymous Vichek model, uh, the interaction between the spins is still the same as in the passive magnet I just showed you, but now each of the spins move in the direction it is pointing in. And uh, 
this model has been looked at, uh, this uh, Vichek model has been uh, studied for the last more than 25 years. And because of this, we now know uh, the physics of the phase in which all spins move on average in the same direction and the transition to that phase, both we understand them fairly well, though it actually still, you know, throws up surprises from time to time. Uh, and we know that this is incredibly different. I mean, uh, this is very different from uh, what happens in a passive magnet. Uh, first thing, you know, uh, here the spins all move in the same direction and because of this motion, uh, you can actually order, uh, remember I said that uh, at high enough dimensionality, passive magnets order, uh, this kind of moving uh, magnets, flying magnets can actually order in a lower dimension and uh, the transition actually completely has a different character uh, for, uh, you know, for the experts, it's actually a first order transition instead of being a second order transition as in a magnet. But okay, because we understand uh, the physics of this kind of model, we can describe this sort of uh, bird flocks, for instance, as examples of condensed matter systems, right? And that is the end goal of you know active matter physics in some sense. So I have till now told you about uh, objects that are polar and active. Uh, there are objects of other symmetries which are also active. For instance, you can have objects that are elongated like this, but don't have an arrow on them. So these objects don't move on average in some direction. They shuffle more along their long axis and a bit less along their short axis. So it's sort of like they have greater kinetic energy along their uh, long axis and less kinetic energy transfers to this. And you can have uh, objects with chiral asymmetry, which don't move in a straight line, but because they're chiral, actually spontaneously keep rotating like this. And these are sort of objects that I'll focus on today. Okay, so I'll focus on these objects, objects like this, which continuously spin and not objects which continuously move, right? Okay. So what are, what are chiral objects? Chirality is, uh, chiral objects are those which are not superimposable on their mirror image. So this escargot, is uh, chiral because it's not superimposable on its mirror image. So it's uh, so is uh, DNA. Uh, again, it's not superimposable on its mirror image. In two dimensions, if you look at a two-dimensional surface, strictly from yeah, if you look at the two-dimensional okay. If you look at this two-dimensional surface strictly from one side, that is the surface is oriented, that is it has a no natural normal direction, then much simpler objects like this Tetris block here is also chiral. You cannot superimpose this uh, on its mirror image by a rotation purely in 2D. You have to flip this to uh, in 3D to superimpose this, right? So if you if that flip is not allowed, then this object is chiral. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, anyone who has who remembers playing Tetris would know that this block and this block were very different objects in Tetris. Uh, so chiral objects are really common in nature, almost all biomolecules are chiral, and uh, they lead to a wide variety of uh, phases, uh, even in equilibrium matter, equilibrium systems, uh, wide variety of collective behaviors, even in equilibrium system. In fact, the first liquid crystal ever discovered in 1888 was actually a chiral liquid crystal, which is a cholesteric liquid crystal in which chiral particles, elongated and chiral particles, lined up in a plane in some direction, but the direction the elongated particles lined up twisted in the direction transverse to that plane. So you had particles lined up like this, which twisted in the Z direction. So that was a cholesteric. So what happens now if uh, chiral objects, these kind of chiral objects are also active? Well, the simplest thing you could do is to say that we know, uh, you know, the phases chiral objects form in equilibrium. We can now ask what happens to these phases uh, when the objects are also active. And we did some of that. For instance, we showed that an active version of the cholesterol phase that I just told you about 
hosts an a uh, columnar antiferromagnetic vortex lattice array and a 2D color streak, which is what we call a density banded phase uh, in a chiral active system does not exist. It's generically un unstable. But today I'm going to focus on a different question. Today I'm ask, going to ask whether uh, the combination of activity and chirality can lead to new phases, that is phases that are not possible in equilibrium. And by that, I mean phases that break symmetries that cannot be broken in equilibrium. Okay, and I'll focus on 2D active systems, 2D chiral systems. Uh, just a note that, you know, 2D chiral systems are not a theoretical contrivance. Uh, they, they abound in biology. So this is a chiral organization, 2D chiral organization of uh, intracellular filaments in a cell. And this is a 2D chiral organization of cells in a cell layer, in a tissue or, you know, cell layer. So this will be my schematic, this kind of a Tetris block will be my schematic of an elongated and chiral object. Uh, because these objects are chiral and because they're active, they'll spontaneously rotate. So the simplest uh, collective, uh, you know, ordered phase that these kind of elongated chiral objects can form is they can line up their long axis, right? Uh, like this. But because each of these objects are uh, active and they're rotating, each of these, uh, even when they line up, they'll still tend to rotate. What that means is that the ordering direction that these particles order in spontaneously rotates in time. So this forms a phase that has no equilibrium analog because in equilibrium, nothing can spontaneously rotate. And this phase breaks time translation symmetry. Uh, to see this, note the following. You know, if you had a disordered collection of these kind of spontaneously rotating particles, and if you took two photographs of uh, this, uh, of a disordered collection of these spontaneously rotating particles at two different times, you could not statistically distinguish them. They're just a bunch of uh, particles uh, pointing in some arbitrary direction. However, because these are aligned, uh, two photographs at two different time points are statistically distinguishable because they are uh, pointing in different directions. So if you actually drew a sort of axis in your uh, plane and then photo took two different photographs, they would be statistically distinguishable. And if you then, you know, took this video of the entire process of these rotating particles and average them over one time period, no specific direction is picked out. So though individual, uh, you know, these particles at a single time point align in some direction, the no rotation symmetry is broken in a time average sense. That is, if you take, uh, uh, you know, no specific direction is picked out in a time average sense. So rotation symmetry in this kind of system is only broken stroboscopically. That is, if you take a photograph at uh, every, uh, with the frequency of the rotation time period, with a frequency that matches the rotation time period, you would see that uh, you are pointing in some direction. So this system breaks time translation symmetry, it restores rotation symmetry, uh, and rotation symmetry is only broken stroboscopically. But all of this is very similar to what I told you about color streaks some time ago, except that in the color streak, the direction of alignment twists in space and here it twists in time. So I call this state a time color streak. So I've argued that a time color streak state can exist in an active system. So does it actually exist? To check this, I should check whether this state is stable to perturbations. For this, I'll have to construct the dynamical equation of this uh, time color streak state and introduce a perturbation in those dynamical equation and check whether that perturbation grows or decays with time. And the most crucial question is whether this kind of a time color streak state is stable in a bulk fluid. And why is that crucial? Because at every instant, uh, a time color streak is nothing but an aligned state of elongated active particles. And what happens to elongated ordered states of elongated active particles in a fluid? Well, active particles lead to fluid flows in a fluid 
and fluid flows reorient elongated particles. So the question is, what happens to uh, you know an aligned state of active particles due to these uh, fluid flows that active particles induce, and uh, the consequent reorientation due to the flow? Well, it was it has been known since two thousand two that in bulk fluids, no such aligned phase can actually exist in uh, active fluids. And uh, this was shown first by Simha and Ramaswamy by a sort of proof by contradiction. That is, they assumed such an aligned phase exists and showed that it must always be unstable. That is, more specifically, they showed that for particles that push fluid out along their long axis, a perturbation along the ordering direction is unstable. That is, a bent perturbation is unstable. Whereas, you know, when you have particles that pull fluid in, like so these are like chamidomona. So in a particles that pull fluid in along the long axis, a perturbation transverse to the ordering direction happens to be unstable. Uh, more quantitatively, uh, the growth rate of uh, fluctuations, once you take an align of fluctuations starting from an aligned state is proportional to this, where this uh, zeta is uh, zeta is the active uh, strength of the active fluid flow, and this lambda is the flow alignment, strength of flow alignment. So what you can see from here and phi, this phi here is the angle between the initial ordering direction and the wave vector of perturbation. So what you can see here is that uh, this growth rate changes sign as you know, phi crosses pi by four or phi crosses 45 degrees. So that means uh, immediately that what that means is that uh, uh, this kind of an aligned state is always unstable irrespective of the sign of uh, zeta or uh, the magnitude of it in fact also. Uh, this is always unstable to some, for some perturbations. Let's actually look at this slightly more carefully. So uh, we want to examine the stability of an aligned state. For that, we need a quantity that measures the degree of alignment. And uh, this is measured by the apolar order parameter. And apolar because these particles don't know their head from their tail. Uh, so they're not pointing in some direction, but pointing along some axis. Uh, this apolar order parameter is, that is a dyadic. Uh, in some director, which is the which is the vector you can draw on any of these particles, and whether uh, you draw the vector this way or the opposite way doesn't matter, because uh, the sign of n does not matter. So the direction of alignment is denoted by q, and because of the equations. So first, So this is uh, viscous force. I balance the other forces. The first is the pressure gradient, which enforces the constraint of inflexibility, uh, because uh, at these speeds, all fluids are incompressible. You have an active force, which tells you that a vectorial distortion in the Q tensor field 
leads to enforce either along the direction of vectorial distortion or opposite to the direction of vectorial distortion. I can now uh, calculate uh, the dynamics of a fluctuation about a state a steady state. So I construct a state, uh, I construct an initial state which is aligned along the x direction and consider fluctuations theta about that state aligned along the x direction. I can uh, introduce this uh, form of the Q tensor here, solve for the velocity equation and obtain an equation for this C angle theta. Doing this, I can find the eigenfrequency of, uh, in the linearized approximation, I can find the eigenfrequency of these angular fluctuations. And it has this particular form, which I showed you already. This implies, and here again, I remind you that phi is the angle between the ordering direction and the web vector of perturbation. And uh, this implies that you have a positive growth rate either just above or just below pi by four. Okay, it's not working. Uh, is this better? Yes, I think so. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so you have, uh, you're either unstable uh, for perturbations, uh, for split or bent perturbations. And note that uh, this growth rate is actually independent of wave number. What that means is that if you have a large enough system, you will always, irrespective of any other, uh, you know, stabilizing mechanism like elasticity, you will always see this instability. Nothing can prevent this instability at large enough scales for large enough systems. Another way of saying this is if you start a system which are initially aligned, then at a time scale determined by the ratio of the viscosity and the activity, uh, that system will always become disordered. That is, there is no aligned active fluid. And uh, this kind of, uh, this instability has been seen in a wide range of system, ranging from intracellular gels uh, to bacterial fluids, to you know, cell layers, etc., and uh, because of this, you know, all of these systems uh, are always uh, spatiotemporally chaotic like this. They always uh, evolve in these complicated patterns, and uh, you know, they are never quiescent. Okay, and that is because of this instability. Uh, I must point out that this instability really only works in bulk fluids. So, if you have an active fluid on a substrate like this table then this instability does not work anymore. Uh, and in fact, you can remain ordered for an active fluid lying on the table for arbitrary activities. Similarly, if you have an active, uh, you know, uh, active, uh, you can have an ordered phase in an active fluid at a fluid air interface. So if you have an active fluid, it will not order in the bulk, but at the fluid air interface, you can have an ordered state. So it's really in bulk fluids that this instability works. So the real question for my uh, time caller trick is whether it is uh, whether it is stable in bulk unbounded two-dimensional fluids. Right. So that is what I'll have to check now. And I I still uh, have the same variables. I still retain the same variables. I retain a direction of alignment. Uh, to uh, account for the alignment of uh, the chiral elongated active particles, I retain a velocity field, and I'll again construct the equation for the uh, these two quantities. The most important uh, quantity, uh, the most important effect now, new effect now, is that the direction of alignment spontaneously rotates. And this term accounts for the spontaneous rotation of the direction of alignment. And then you have the earlier terms that I had, there's a passive alignment. There is a alignment with the shear. There is actually a chiral version of the shear alignment, which just tells you that uh, uh, you know elongated chiral active particles align with a different sort of shear as well. Uh, this turns out not to be very important. The most crucial bit is this: that these particles rotate. So the direction of alignment now spontaneously rotates. Now again, I'll construct the equation for the velocity field. Uh, 
again in the Stokes regime, again in the regime uh, in which the dynamics is Aristotelian. So first again, I have the pressure gradient, I have the achiral active force that I had earlier, which tells you that a vectorial distortion leads to a force either along or opposite to the direction of the vectorial asymmetry. And I have a chiral active force, which tells me, because the system is chiral, you now know left from right. So I have a chiral active force, which tells me that if I have a vectorial asymmetry, which I, if I have a vectorial distortion in the Q tensor field, I have a force perpendicular to the direction of that vectorial asymmetry, whether it's to the left or to the right is determined by chirality. So again, uh, I do what I just did, which is uh, I parametrize uh, the Q tensor. Uh, I start out my uh, system in, along in some X direction and parametrize the Q tensor with some angle field. But crucially now, my state without fluctuations already rotates at a constant angular speed. So the Q tensor already spontaneously rotates at a constant angular speed. So I have to consider fluctuations about this spontaneously rotating state. I do that and uh, introduce this form, uh, this answers for Q in this equation solve for the velocity field and average over this rotation time period. Doing this, I see that the dynamics of delta theta fluctuations about a spontaneous rotating, about the spontaneously rotating state, uh, averaged over the time period has this form. What this means is that uh, if this quantity here is positive, you see that a delta initial delta theta fluctuation decays exponentially to zero. That is, uh, if this quantity here is positive, you have a stable time cholesterol phase. How did this happen? Uh, an aligned state of active particles I just explained was always unstable. How does spontaneous rotation stabilize such an aligned state? Well, consider, uh, consider an aligned state which would be unstable to this kind of bend fluctuations. However, because each of these particles is uh, rotating, because the aligned direction of alignment is rotating, uh, the bend fluctuations, uh, this kind of fluctuations, in some time change to uh, fluctuations of this sort, which are stable. So basically, uh, rotation stabilizes an aligned state uh, by you know, rotating out of configurations that were unstable. Let's actually look at this slightly more carefully. So if the particles were not rotating, this would be the growth rate. I've already shown you this for some time, uh, some time ago. And here phi is the angle between the perturbation direction and the direction of alignment. But now, uh, in a chiral system, the phi is no longer a constant. It changes because the direction of alignment spontaneously changes. So the delta theta, uh, you know, the corresponding equation for a chiral system would be this, where omega is the rotation, uh, is the rotation of the direction of alignment, is the time period of the rotation of the direction of alignment, right? So, uh, the d, uh, so the phi, which is the direction, uh, angle between the perturbation direction and the direction of alignment, now continuously changes because the direction of alignment changes. And now if I average this over the rotation time period, the average of cos two uh, of this object, cos two phi minus omega t is zero, but the average of this guy is non-zero. And that is why I get a finite value here. It's actually easy to understand this kind of uh, how rotation stabilizes this sort of uh, aligned state. This is very much like, you know, if you have a ball on a saddle, uh, the ball will roll down the sides of the saddle if the saddle is, uh, you know, if I just have a saddle on the table and if I have a ball on it, the ball will roll down the sides of the saddle, right? But now if I rotate the saddle, what will happen is before the, and rotate the saddle fast enough, what will happen is, the ball will not roll down the sides of the saddle. Before it can roll down, it'll hit the, you know, the upward curve bits of the saddle and get stabilized. So if I rotate a saddle fast enough, the ball, I can keep a ball on a saddle. This is also exactly the way, you know, you have uh, th that you can uh, stabilize ions in iron traps. So you know that uh, we learn in uh, 
I don't know, high school or college, uh, that you cannot have, because of Earnshaw's theorem, you cannot have a global minimum, minimum in a electrostatic potential. If you now rotate uh, the electric field, you can, however, stabilize an ion in a trap. So you, all uh, ion traps are uh, use either rotating on electric or magnetic fields. And this is a very similar mechanism here realized in a very different context. So what I've told you till now is that uh, these kind of time cholesteric states are stable to smooth fluctuations, what are called technically uh, spin wave fluctuations. However, uh, active aligned states are also unstable because of a different reason, which I have not told you till now. And that is because of unbinding of topological defects. Uh, topological defects are singular solutions of a singular excitations of uh, and uh, in elongated active elongated uh, active elongated systems as such as pneumatics there are, the topological defects primarily have two charges plus half and minus half a plus half topological defect has a vectorial structure such as this and a minus half defect has a threefold uh, symmetric structure uh, such as this okay okay so this is what happens in a passive uh, pneumatic what happens in an active pneumatic? Well, in an active system, any vectorial asymmetry leads to the corresponding motion. Therefore, plus half defects, which are polar, which have this kind of a structure, move in the direction uh, in which they're pointing in. However, minus half defects like this have a threefold symmetry and they don't move, they just diffuse around. Therefore, you can show that at least at low noise, plus half defects and minus half defects in active pneumatics always unbind, destroying the aligned state. So this is another mechanism via which aligned states are destroyed, uh, aligned active states are destroyed. So now what happens uh, to these defects in time cholesterol? First, uh, uh, because I told you that uh, time cholesterol there's a force transverse to the vectorial asymmetry direction, uh, the velocity of a plus half defect is not along its polarity, but at an angle to this. And uh, this is, in fact, one of the easiest ways of me measuring uh, the ratio of active chiral and achiral uh, force in experiments in cell layers, etc. Which are, you know, so all of these theories are actually applicable to cell layers and uh, intercellular gels. And uh, this is one of the easier ways of measuring the. Uh, ratio of the two active forces in an active chiral system. More importantly, more importantly than, you know, uh, the plus half defect moving at an angle to the polarity direction, because uh, the, because each of these particles is now spinning, because you have a time cholesterol state, the direction of an isolated plus half defect spontaneously rotates. That means an isolated plus half defect in a time cholesterol does not move in a straight line like it would do in a pneumatic, but moves in a circle. Therefore, if you have a plus minus half defect pair, uh, the plus half defect doesn't run away from the minus half defect, but actually spirals into the minus half defect. Therefore, uh, time cholesterols are stable both in uh, you know, unbounded fluids and in any other geometry you can think of and they're stable against defect unbinding. What that means is that time cholesterol uh, phases that I've just uh, talked about should be seen in experiments uh, in active systems. And that indeed turns out to be the case. This is an example of a time cholesterol state, which was observed around the, actually just after we predicted this state will exist in experiments on motor microtubule gels. Here the microtubule organization, you can see uh, rotates uh, in a period of six hours, just as we predicted. And in uh, experiments in which motor microtubule gels do not rotate, they are unstable, they cannot remain aligned. However, as you can see here, they remain aligned uh, because they're basically rotating. So, okay, this is uh, all I wanted to say about time color tricks. Uh, so uh, till now I have talked about uh, spontaneously rotating states, which have a sort of uh, pneumatic stroboscopic asymmetry. 
You can also have states with a different stroboscopic asymmetry, such as the such as hexagonal asymmetry as here. And uh, when you have you know these kind of hexatic particles which all rotate in phase in the same direction, you can have a hexatic time crystal uh, such as this, where you know you have they all rotate in phase uh, together. This is in an artificial active system from the group of Jeremy Palachi. And this is a very similar uh, state where uh, the cells have a roughly hexagonal packing and uh, clusters of cells rotate in phase uh, in the same direction. Uh, and this is another example of this hexagonal, uh, hexatic time crystal. We created a theory of this as well. Uh, one of the one of the modifications we did was actually to introduce a further effect, uh, which basically tells you that if you are very crowded, your rotation rate slows down, which is uh, easy to understand. And uh, I don't, I won't explain uh, what we did here in much detail. Just I'll just like to point out uh, that in these systems, even in a highly dissipative medium, uh, the distortions propagate like a sound wave. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, these are, and this is an angle field beating against a uh, density field. And normally you think of sound waves when a velocity like quantity beats against a position like quantity. Here, uh, you have a sound wave, even though both density and uh, orientation are position like quantities. And, uh, so this is one of the peculiarities of uh, time liquid crystals. So to just recap, I have told you that time periodic liquid crystal. I have told you about time periodic liquid crystalline phases in chiral active systems, which have stroboscopic inatic spatial asymmetry, and they are distinct physically from their non-rotating counterparts in the sense that uh, I have told you that uh, time cholesterols are stable in unbounded fluids, and hexatic time crystals have waves, whereas uh, you know. Uh, hexatic active systems or uh, active pneumatics are behave very differently. So I just quickly want to point out a further uh, thing. So I have till now told you that uh, time liquid crystals exist in chiral active systems. I'll now tell you that chirality is not a require is not required for uh, time liquid crystals. Time liquid crystals can also exist in achiral systems due to something that's called non-reciprocal interactions. And this is one way uh, we put information back into active matter. So what are non-reciprocal interactions? In equilibrium, interactions come from some Hamiltonian or some from some energy. Because of this, interactions are reciprocal. That is, if you have a red particle and a purple particle, then if the red particle wants to align with the purple particle, then the purple particle wants to align with the red particle and they end up aligning with each other. However, in a, an active system, interactions don't arise from a free energy. They don't have, uh, they are not minimizing some energy. And these interactions can be non-reciprocal. That is, a purple particle can try to align with a red particle, but a red particle may want to anti-align with a purple particle. Because of this, these particles may chase one another. And you know you can have a, them chasing one another and spontaneously rotating. The direction of this, the sense of this rotation is arbitrary. So it's a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So chiral symmetry is broken spontaneously, unlike in my previous examples, where the direction of rotation was determined by the shape of the particles. Here, if the if these become, uh, you know, if these start rotating because of non-reciprocal interactions, the chiral symmetry is broken spontaneously and this direction of this rotation is arbitrary. However, you know, if you have a bunch of these objects, they can form a phase in which the direction of alignment again rotates exactly as uh, the time cholesterol as I showed you earlier. So this is an example of a time cholesterol in a system which is not chiral. So chiral symmetry is broken spontaneously. This sort of time liquid crystals uh, arising out of non-reciprocal interactions have been considered. Uh, so a pneumatic version was considered by uh, Chung, uh, Mike Case, and Sriram Ramaswamy. And uh, I have been considering uh, the hexatic version of this with my collaborator Cesare Nardini. And uh, 
non reciprocity non reciprocal interactions are again something that's not special these kind of interactions are generically present in all active systems what this means is time liquid crystals that i just described are generically possible in any active system so the only real requirement for time liquid crystals is activity it's not chirality it's not microscopic non reciprocity so to conclude what i've shown you that active intrinsically chiral systems can form time translation symmetry broken states by rotation symmetries broken only stroboscopically and restored in a time average sense however chirality is not essential for time liquid crystals uh you know if you have non reciprocal interactions that can have lead to broken uh, chiral symmetry and you can have time liquid crystals without intrinsic chirality so what do we go from here is it possible to have crystals in space and time is probably not possible and the reason for this is uh this kind of spontaneous rotation destroys spatial crystalline order however if you have active crystals then uh emergent non reciprocity as i just described can lead to chiral symmetry breaking and uh you know try to create time hexadic time crystals that i just described and uh, this tendency is frustrated due to elasticity which can lead to a new form of uh phase new form of uh, liquid solid phase transition mediated by green boundaries which has no analog in passive systems and i'm examining this uh currently and the other uh important uh line of research here is to understand what defects do in these kind of uh time cholesteric systems what happens to costly to this transition etc so i thank uh, the collaborators with whom i did all of the work uh, described here i mean all of the work i mentioned here in particular the work on time liquid crystal was done with uh, rafael vatuye and martin lens and thank you for your uh, patience Thank you.